Hello and welcome. I'm Nidhi Bansal, editor of Current Protocols at John Wiley & Sons Publishers, and I'm delighted to introduce today's webinar titled Containment of DNA by HEPA Filters to Reduce Potential DNA Contamination in Experiments. This webinar is being co-sponsored by Baker and Current Protocols, a Wiley publication. Founded in 1949, the Baker Company is a pioneer in the field of biological safety and reliable laboratory contamination control equipment. The company's core operations include manufacturing, engineering and design, research, testing, quality control, technical support, and customer service. The construction of Baker laboratory equipment is marked by a focus on function, user comfort, durability, and always safety. Through innovation and collaboration with customers, the company has developed truly revolutionary technology in biocontainment and contamination control for a wide variety of industries and applications. Published by Wiley, Current Protocols is in its 31st year and provides the highest quality, peer-reviewed, and regularly updated step-by-step -step research protocols to life scientists worldwide. With 18 titles and over 20,000 protocols containing exquisite procedural detail, extensive troubleshooting tips, and example results, Current Protocols provides researchers with reliable, efficient methods to ensure reproducible results. During today's presentation, we encourage you to submit your questions throughout the event by clicking on the Ask a Question box at the bottom of your screen. Your questions will not be seen by any of the other attendees. The webinar will be recorded and available for viewing in the next few days. We will send you an email with details of how to access the on-demand webinar. Stop. Stop. Start. During today's presentation, we encourage you to submit your questions throughout the event by clicking on the Ask a Question box at the bottom of your screen. Your questions will not be seen by any of the other attendees. The webinar will be recorded and available for viewing in the next few days. We will send you an email with details of how to access the on-demand webinar. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Kara Held. Dr. Held earned her PhD at the University of Vermont Cell and Myel... Stop. Dr. Held earned her PhD at the University of Vermont Cell and Molecular Biology program and then completed her postdoctoral training at Yale University in the Vascular Biology and Therapeutics program. She worked as a lab manager, safety officer, and a researcher at the Harvard Stem Cell Institute. She then joined Baker as the science director, where she has helped provide some much-needed clarity into the nuances of biosafety using biosafety cabinets. So let's get started. A very warm welcome to you, Dr. Kara Held. Hello, thanks for joining us. Um, today we're going to be talking about the effectiveness of HEPA filters on capturing DNA. A little bit about myself um, first, as I said, I uh, got my bachelor's degree at Quinnipiac University, earned my PhD at the University of Vermont in cell and molecular biology, did my postdoctoral training at Yale in the vascular biology and therapeutics group, and was a lab manager at the Harvard group. All of these experiences actually helped me um, develop all of the techniques that we're going to be talking about in this webinar and other research that we do here at Baker. So today's presentation, we're going to be talking about different types of biosafety cabinets, or BSCs, and HEPA filters and how they work. They work. And then we're going to be talking about uh, DNA and why this is a problem in HEPA filters. And then we'll go into the experimental design, results, conclusions, and then some recommendations for how to deal with this problem. So first, biosafety cabinets, or BSCs. These are ventilated enclosures that for work with biohazard agents assigned to biosafety levels one through four as per the BMBL. Biosafety cabinets provide three levels of containment, 
which include personnel protection, or the protection of the person who's working in front of the cabinet, product protection, or protection on what you're working on, so your experiment, your cells, or whatever you're constructing inside the biosafety cabinet, and environmental protection, so protecting people um, in the outside lab around you, as well as outside of the building that you're working on. Because if you're working on something hazardous inside the biosafety cabinet, you don't want to infect your lab mates, the office workers nearby, or anybody who's walking by the building. Biosafety cabinets provide these three levels of protection through the use of HEPA filters, or high efficiency particulate air filters. HEPA filters, by definition, have to filter out 99.97% or better of all particles that in this is measured at 0.3 micrometer mass median diameter of a dispersed oil particulate. So what this means is, is that um, any particle that is greater or smaller than this size will be filtered better than 99.97%. And all HEPA filters inside biosafety cabinets have an efficiency of 99.99%, so they're even greater than the definition of a HEPA filter. But what's important is that HEPA filters cannot filter out gases and vapors. So there is a particle size, such as an atom of a gas or a vapor, that is too small to be captured in a HEPA filter. So as you can see here, this is the capture efficiency graph of a HEPA filter. So greater or smaller than their most penetrating size, which is 0.22 micrometers, HEPA filters filter out almost everything, so they're up to 100% effective. At its worst, it's 99.97%, and this is only at that particular size, most penetrating particle size of 0.22 microns. So that will come into account later on. NSF is the National Sanitation Foundation, and they are responsible for creating an international testing standard for all biosafety cabinets. This is standard 49. And they are the guiding body that determine that all HEPA filters used in biosafety cabinets have to have a minimum of 99.99% effectiveness when tested against this particular size, 0.3 micrometer particulates. They chose this particle size because it's close to the most penetrating particle size, so you want to see how bad the HEPA filters could be. And in, that, in this situation, they're actually very good. Now biosafety cabinets. Biosafety cabinets are sorted into three different classes. There's class one cabinets, which provide only personnel and environmental protection. Class two cabinets, which are most of the biosafety cabinets you'll ever see. They provide all three levels of protection, and these are split into four different types. Type A1, type A2, type B1, and type B2. The type A1 and A2 are very similar to each other. They are both a recirculating cabinet, which means they recirculate air within the cabinet. An A1 has a lower intake velocity coming in through the front access opening than the A2 cabinet. The A2 cabinet is the most common style of cabinet that you'll find pretty much everywhere in every lab. A B1 cabinet also has a partial recirculation, but it also is partially exhausted. And a B2 cabinet is a 100% exhausted cabinet. So if you ever hear the term 100% exhaust, they're talking about a type B2 cabinet. Class three cabinets are only reserved for the highly infectious agents, so the Ebola's and the Zika's out there. They are gas-tight physical barriers that you have to work through gloves in. Um, these are usually reserved for the biosafety level four and higher, and uh, three and four work. Although biosafety level three and four can be done in a class two biosafety cabinet, you just have to have extra equipment with um, personal protection. First, we're going to talk about the Class II Type A2 biosafety cabinets. As we said, they provide personnel, product, and environmental protection. They have a minimum intake air velocity of 100 feet per minute, and it is a partial recirculation. So as you can see from the diagram, they have two HEPA filters in them. The top one is the exhaust HEPA filter, and the one about in the middle is called the supply HEPA filter. This is what gives HEPA filtered clean air to the work zone. Room air will enter in through the front, and combine with any contaminated air that's inside the biosafety cabinet and go up the back plenum and be pushed by a motor blower into a positive pressure plenum, which is then partially vented outside the, outside the cabinet through the exhaust HEPA filter 
and then part of the air comes down into the downflow air to provide it to the work zone, which is also HEPA filtered. Type B2 cabinets are a little different. These ones are not recirculated inside. All of the air is vented out through a building's exhaust system. They too have a minimum intake air of 100 feet per minute. But the air that is provided to the work zone is pulled in through the top, pushed through a motor blower, through a supply HEPA filter into the work zone. And then all of this air with the room air is collected through an under the surface, under the work surface HEPA filter and filtered out completely through the building's exhaust system. So this would be your 100% exhausted cabinet. Now, many laboratory procedures create aerosols during their use. And aerosols are problematic because these could lead to cross-contamination or contamination of other people. And this is what biosafety cabinets are used for controlling. So you can use a lot of different techniques to create aerosols, such as syringes, as you can see in the picture there, as you're pulling a syringe through a vacuum sealed vial. As you pull it out, you can get some spray. Centrifuges, as they spin around, can create aerosols, as well as uh, pop cap tubes, such as Eppendorf tubes. As you pop them open, you can create an aerosol there. You also, when you're blowing out a pipette with a handheld pipetter, pouring liquids, or shaking or vortexing tubes, there's a lot of different techniques that will create aerosols. And using a biosafety cabinet, you want to control all of them. Now, if you're using aerosols that contain a DNA solution, this is where our, the question of today comes into play. So we want to know, is DNA captured in a biosafety cabinet? Now, DNA really is a very special molecule. It is quite small, and about how small it is may come into play with the HEPA filter. It's sticky because of its negatively charged backbone, but it also can change shape. It can be globular, it can be linear, it can be fragmented. So we don't know exactly how it's going to react with the HEPA filter. Will it stick to it? Will it pass right through? Could it become dislodged? So if the HEPA filter was bumped or jostled, could you recontaminate your work zone? Currently, it's unknown. So we're here to find out if that's true or not. So we tested um, two different scenarios in our experiments here to determine that. So in the first test, we're going to do a direct application of an, a DNA aerosol to a HEPA filter. So this is actually spraying a DNA solution created into an aerosol directly onto a HEPA filter to see how much will stick and how much passes through. Test two is we take the DNA aerosol within a type two, type, class two, type A2 biosafety cabinet, which is internally recirculating, and see where the DNA lands within the cabinet. And as it passes through the cabinet, does that get stuck in the supply or exhaust HEPA filter. And if some does get through, how much? And then once the cabinet is full of contaminated DNA, can it be removed with standard fumigation techniques or with a, the physical wiping with bleach and ethanol? So we are going to use a collision nebulizer to create our DNA aerosol. These, this nebulizer uses air to create one, about one micrometer sized droplet. So it's quite uniform, so this is why it's a great nebulizer to be using for this. Our DNA solution contains 10 to the 9th copies of DNA per mil in a TE buffer, a standard DNA buffer. So we know exactly how much DNA will be applied to the HEPA filter, and then we can measure exactly how many copies come through. First, we're going to start with the Class II Type B2 biosafety cabinet. And using the Baker Class II Type B2, the Biochem Guard, we know that this style cabinet has a HEPA filter right below the work surface. And we're going to use this to our advantage here. Also, because it is hooked up to the building's exhaust system, if there was a power failure, we want to see if that will jostle the DNA off of the, DNA, of the HEPA filter. This style cabinet also has filters that are easy to remove, so we can Test, um, reach our test samples very quickly. So here is um, some pictures from our experiment. We placed the nebulizer either 6, 9, or 12 inches above the HEPA filter so we could see um, the dis distance made a difference. And we tested it with HEPA filters in place as seen on the left-hand side, 
and removed on the right hand side. So we have a positive and a negative control. And as you can see from our results, when the HEPA filters were in place, no matter what side of the cabinet we were working on, we saw absolutely no DNA coming through. When we removed the HEPA filters, there's quite a lot of DNA that came through. Obviously, there's nothing to inhibit that. If we simulated a power failure and bumped the HEPA filters, no DNA came off. So what this tells us is that when DNA is applied directly to a HEPA filter, at either a distance of 6, 9, or 12 inches away, it didn't matter, a DNA would stick to the HEPA filter and could not be jostled off. So DNA aerosols applied directly to a HEPA filter are captured with a 100% efficiency. Power failures, failures and mechanical forces did not dislodge the DNA from the HEPA filter. All right, so how about test two when we put DNA inside a recirculating type A2 cabinet? Here we're using the Baker's Class II Type A2 biosafety cabinet, the Sterile Guard. This is a partially internally recirculating cabinet and you can see with the red X's where we did our sample locations. So we sampled right on the work surface, below the work surface, upstream and downstream of the supply HEPA filter, and downstream of the exhaust HEPA filter. So this way we can see exactly where the DNA is landing and then how much is getting through the HEPA filters. So here's an, a depiction of where we put the nebulizers just outside the, um, the work opening. And those circles you see on the work surface are Wattman filter paper. This is how we collected the DNA. So we used either filter paper, glass sides, which we could either we could swipe with a cotton swab afterwards, or we could swab exactly the stainless steel surface. And so we, of course, used pre-wetted um, swabs to make sure that we collected every bit of DNA we could. All right, so if we look at all of the different locations, with the pre-cleaning, so an empty cabinet, no DNA of, um, been sprayed on it. We did not detect any DNA, as we shouldn't. Under the work surface, which is where all of the air first goes, we saw quite a bit. On the work surface, there was a little bit. We detected 65 copies. Upstream of the supply HEPA, where you'd expect to find a ton of DNA, we did. But surprisingly, downstream of the supply and the exhaust HEPA filter, we did detect DNA. And since we knew exactly how much DNA was sprayed into the cabinet, we could determine its capture efficiency. And these HEPA filters were determined to capture DNA 99.99% or better, which is interesting because that is the exact definition of HEPA filter. Now we know that the internal surfaces of the biosafety cabinet were covered with DNA. So if we subjected the cabinet to chlorine dioxide fumigation overnight, which is standard biosafety cabinet biodecontamination technique. Would that remove the DNA? And if not, would wiping with 10% bleach and following up, of course, with the 70% ethanol wipe remove the rest of the DNA? As a side note, if you're ever using bleach on a stainless steel work, um, surface in a biosafety cabinet, it has to be followed up with a wipe of either sterile water or ethanol, or else you're going to rust out the surface. Okay, so now the results. Before we decontaminated, we detected over 3 billion copies of DNA on the surface. After the chlorine dioxide fumigation, there was detecting only one tenth to the seventh, which means we removed 99.7% of the DNA, which is um, fantastic, but still not a complete removal. So there could be a potential source for cross-contamination, even though you think that you've decontaminated the surface. After cleaning with bleach and ethanol, there was no DNA left. Bleach and ethanol was the only surefire way to remove all traces of DNA from the surface. That led to a 100% removal efficiency. So putting this all together, DNA aerosols applied directly to a HEPA filter are captured with 100% efficiency. Power failures and mechanical forces did not dislodge DNA from the HEPA filter. DNA within the airstream of a biosafety cabinet is removed with 99.99% or greater efficiency, but 
some cross-contamination would be possible. Chlorine dioxide decontamination only removed 99.7% of the DNA. Leach and ethanol with physical wiping was the only way to remove 100%. So what does this mean? We know that one, mic one micrometer droplets of air are captured at 100% efficiency, which you can see with the, the red X on that graph of the capture efficiency of a HEPA filter makes perfect sense. But as the droplets are passing through the airstream, they are drying and they are becoming smaller. The size, DNA particle sizes are about 0.2 microns, which is exactly the most penetrating size for a HEPA filter, which makes sense of why we were seeing some HEPA filter le um, leak through of the DNA. So this would reduce its capture efficiency down to the rating of the HEPA filter. So what this means is that DNA aerosols may be captured by HEPA filters, but it's completely size dependent. And as DNA particles are dried, they will be removed according to the HEPA's efficiency rating. So if you have a higher efficiency rating on your HEPA filter, you will have a greater efficiency in removing the DNA from the airstream. If you have a lower efficient HEPA filter, you're gonna have a lower efficient removal rating. Fumigation decontamination is not enough to remove all DNA. The bleach, ethanol, and the physical wiping is required. So what would we recommend? So if you are worried about DNA contamination coming through your airstream, you could use a higher rated HEPA filter, such as an ULPA or an ultra-low particulate air filter, which has a rating of 99.999% efficiency, or a SULPA, which is super ultra-low particulate air, which has an efficiency rating of 99.9999%. You could use two HEPA filters in tandem, which would be 99.99% of 99.99%. But what's gonna be more critical, even though just removing the, the potential chance for our DNA to come out, would be your cabinet selection. So how it's handling its airflow. So we looked at these two cabinets the B2 Biochem Guard and the A2 the Sterile Guard. If you're worried about DNA in it in the airstream, a Sterile Guard may not be the best choice because it could it is a recirculating cabinet. The Biochem Guard, however, will capture DNA particles at their source, right below the work surface, which is going to be critical. If you're worried about DNA contamination outside the cabinet, an A2 cabinet where it has a symbol or canopy connection, such as our Flex Air which will push the air outside the building instead of recirculating inside the lab, could be a good choice, choice for you. Also, there's the B1 style cabinet, or the NCB from Baker. This cabinet is partially recirculating, but the partially recirculated air passes through two HEPA filters, one below the work surface and the supply HEPA filter at the top. This would be a double HEPA filtration, which would provide much cleaner air for your work zone so you can have a um, stronger confidence that there's less DNA contamination possibility in your work, as well as in the back of the cabinet, all of the air is vented outside through a separate HEPA filter as well. So this air is filtered and vented outdoors to protect anybody who's in the lab. So this may be a very good choice if you're doing DNA work. And with that, I would like to thank all of our, um, the people who worked on this project um, we have people at Baker, as well as Maine Molecular Quality Controls, Inc., who provided all of the DNA the, and the analysis for us. Thank you. And here are all of the references in case you were wondering. And now I will take any questions. So, Dr. Held, there is a question that can we use viruses in a biosafety cabinet? Yes, you can, um, and that's what this work is uh, specifically focusing towards, is making sure that people who are doing viral work are safe. It's very important to make sure that your viruses aren't going to be cross-contaminating other samples or your workers or even people in the lab who aren't doing the work. So that's why we would recommend doing this inside a biosafety cabinet. Now, if you're concerned about, it depends on what you're concerned about with that virus. If you're not concerned about contaminating people, just your other samples, you might choose a different cabinet. 
based on the, that concern. If you're more concerned about contaminating other people, you might want to um, choose a different cabinet as well. So perhaps that B2 cabinet would be uh, more along the lines of what you would be required. Okay, so another question is that, uh, how about a PCR workstation? Uh, wouldn't a PCR workstation work better and be more cost effective than a biological safety cabinet? What are your views on that? So a, there's a lot of different variations of the PCR workstations and they may be sufficient for what you're requiring, but not all of them have HEPA cleaned air in them. Some are dead air stations where there is no airflow at all. And that would not prevent aerosol formation. So um, if you had a centrifuge in there or you popped open an Eppendorf cap or um, even used a syringe or blew out a, a stereological pipette, all of those things could cause aerosols, which would um, have a source of contamination. And those workstations would not prevent that from happening. If it does have a HEPA cleaned air in it, you get one of the workstations that does have HEPA clean air. It's, lamin it's vertical um, airflow, so it'll flow down from the top to the bottom, but then that will blow out the front and land in your lap. So if you're concerned about personnel protection, the person working there or anybody else in the lab from contamination, you would not want that style cabinet. If you're not worried about it contaminating people, it could work for you. Okay. The next question is about the size of the DNA fragment. And the question is, what was the size of the DNA fragment you used in your test? And since the size of the DNA particle is important, uh, the, the, uh, the person who's asked the question is wondering if uh, how well a short 100 base pair PCR fragment would be captured. So we used a plasmid, it was about 1 kb, I believe. Um, it was plasmid DNA that we tested. I would suspect that a short 100 base pair fragment would also be captured just based on how well it stuck to it. Um, and that is what we anticipated would happen. Um, because the HEPA filter is made up of borosilicate fibers, it really it has, it has the characteristics of being sticky and because DNA is also sticky, they bonded well together. We were concerned that it might um, dry and come off, but that does not seem to be the case. Um, so I would expect that PCR fragments would be captured just as well, as long as you're capturing them early in the aerosol creation process. So those under the work surface HEPA filters, I think would be really important in this situation because of those very small fragments. Um, however, um, it'll be dependent on the rating of your HEPA filter as well. So there could be a potential of some cross-contamination if you captured them later on in the process. Okay, uh, so we d the next question is about RNA. Uh, we did hear you talk about the DNA, but what about RNA? Does RNA get captured as well? We did not specifically test RNA, but I, it has very similar properties to DNA, and yes, it should be captured just as well um, with the same efficiencies. So if you're working in a recirculated hood, you would have some RNA bleed through, so that would be important to plan ahead for. You know, you use your RNAase and uh, clean up properly or um, eliminate that style cabinet for RNA work. You do want to be conscious of that. Okay. Uh, another question is, uh, did you compare the efficiency of UV with that of the HEPA filters and bleach plus ethanol for removing the DNA? We did not compare UV treatment. Um, we're of the mindset that UV isn't nearly as effective as you would like it to be. Um, because it's completely dependent on the age of the bulb and the time, the duration that it's left there. And so if you're working in a biosafety cabinet, we want to make sure that there is more of an of immediate decontamination step rather than one that requires too much time and can be variable, um, especially based on like UV bulb life. Um, it may still look purple, but it's not actually putting out enough energy to be effective. 
So we did not test that. Um, we used uh, the standard protocol of using 10% bleach and a an, 70% uh, ethanol follow-up. Okay. Uh, before I move to the next question, again, a reminder that if you have not yet submitted a question, then please feel free to type in your question and ask a question box that you can see at the bottom of your screen. The next question, Dr. Held, is, uh, is the U is, uh, or rather should I say, how long do you recommend leaving the 10% bleach on surface? 10% uh, bleach, you, we I think we left it for 10 minutes. Um, we wanted to make sure that it had a, um, a good incubation period. Um, although with only um, one minute incubation, we did see removal of that, um, of all the DNA. Um, we recommend doing a full um, incubation, of course, but it is critical to follow it up with that 70% ethanol rinse or at least sterile water afterwards because the bleach left on stainless steel surfaces for too long will cause pitting in the steel, which can either lead to rusting or um, actual dents in the steel, which could have another source of contamination, like it could be caught, caught in those little dents and you wouldn't be able to clean it properly. So it's very important to follow up any sort of bleach treatment on steel with some other sort of a rinse, either um, ethanol or sterile water. Okay, uh, next question is, do you expect all DNA sizes to act similarly? Yes, yes we would. Um, these are based on the principles of the molecule itself. Um, and as the DNA com um, compacts itself, it becomes very small. So it's right about that most penetrating particle size of about 0.2 microns. And that would be the, the worst case scenario. It is possible that smaller things could be captured better, but I don't believe that that's a guarantee that they would be captured better um, because as HEPA filters work, smaller particles do get captured, even with a greater efficiency. So there's a potential that it could capture it even greater than you're expecting, so greater than 99.99%. Um, I would not absolutely guarantee that, though, and I wouldn't bet on it. So if you're keeping in mind the potential for cross-contamination, I think it'll be in a much safer um, frame of mind. Okay. Uh, again, like several of you are asking if uh, this presentation will be available. Uh, I will just remind you that, yes, uh, this presentation uh, will be available for you to view, and we will send out an email to all the attendees uh, you know, shortly after this webinar is over. Moving on to our next question, uh, Dr. Held, uh, there are questions about alternates to bleach. Is, is there anything that you recommend instead of bleach? Um, if you're looking for removal of DNA, um, you want to stick with the chlorine-based cleaners. Um, so most cleaning agents that contain some sort of a chlorine or chloride ion should be as effective. Um, I don't know of any others that would be as effective as bleach is on removing of DNA. Talking about disinfection is a whole other um, game there, so um, depending on what you're trying to remove, but specifically for DNA, I would stick with bleach or any of the chlorine-based cleaners. Okay. Uh, the next question is, uh, how effective uh, do you think are the HIPAA filters in capturing non-biological or external biological components? Uh, for example, dust particles, bacteria, airborne contamina human contamin contaminants when working in cabinets for preparing chemotherapeutics that may lead to contamination of sterile products and promote bacterial growth. Well, HIPAA filters are exactly as effective as what we've presented here with DNA. It does not matter on what it is made out of. It's all dependent on the size. So um, you have bacteria, airborne contaminants, dust particles. Those will all be captured with the same efficiency as we talked about here. So if the particles are about 0.22 microns, they will pen be captured 99.99%. If they are smaller than that, they will be captured better. 
and if they are greater than that 0.22 microns in size, they will be even captured even better. So HEPA filters are not uh, discriminatory on the type of particle, it's all based on size. So they'll be captured just as well. Okay. And what is your opinion on UV air recirculators where the air and the possible DNA aerosols can pass constantly close to a UV tube? Um, I have mixed feelings about those. I know that there's been research showing that that can be effective, but often it takes a long exposure time to that UV light to actually break them down. And so I'm concerned that you won't be getting enough exposure for it to be effective. Um, if you have some sort of detection method at, downstream of that, um, it would make me much more confident that you're getting a good amount of removal. But I wouldn't use that as your sole source of contamination removal. Okay. And uh, one basic question, how do I know that my HEPA filter is functioning properly? Well, HEPA filters uh, can be tricky beasts. Um, they are very fragile, and if and they are touched in the slightest bit, you can form a hole or a tear in them, and you probably wouldn't even know it until you got a contamination problem. HEPA filters, if you suspect that yours is having a contamination problem, you should call your biosafety cabinet certifier and they can scan the HEPA filter for you and determine if it is safe or not. You should be getting your cabinet certified once a year and they will be the HEPA filter will be checked at that certification. And so at least once a year you have a check in there to know that the HEPA filter is in perfect condition. Uh, once they get uh, too damaged, you should repair your HEPA filter. If you're at all concerned that it is um, loading too quickly or that there's a damage in it, you can just get it replaced and you would contact your biosafety cabinet manufacturer or your certifier to do that. Okay. And which style of biosafety cabinet would be best for preventing cross-contamination? Uh, your recommendations for that? So if you're worried about cross-contamination or contaminating other samples that you're working on, you would want to have a cabinet that does not have recirculated air in it. So um, a cabinet style such as a B1 cabinet, which has um, dual HEPA filtered downflow air, may be okay if you're working completely in the back of the cabinet, which is 100% exhausted. But the standard one to go with would probably be a B2 cabinet, where all of the air coming down onto the surface is HEPA filtered initially, and all of the contaminated air is vented outside, so outdoors, after being HEPA filtered as well. So you would not have any of that um, contaminated air recirculated onto your work zone. Okay. Uh, another question uh, is a query about the benefit for following bleach cleaning with a, a, a met. Basically, it's asking that what is the benefit of following a bleach cleaning a metal hood with both water and ethanol? So um, the benefit that you'd get with following with ethanol would be an added decontamination step, so uh, worried about any sort of live biological particulates. Um, the ethanol step also um, can evaporate off the surface. so. Okay, so if you want to weigh your benefits and your um, costs here, if you're doing a very large surface and you're only spraying a light ethanol mist on there, you're not going to remove enough of the bleach residue and you're going to risk that it evaporates too quickly to get that residue off. So a sterile water rinse might be better because then you would ensure that you actually rinse the surface and you can get every nook and cranny. On the other hand, the water can hang around and you have to make sure that you mop it all up so that there would be no um, particles left and no droplets left to dry. So it's really depending on your comfort level and the work surface size that you're working on. Um, I tend to favor the ethanol rinse because I like having that double decontamination. So you're cleaning with the bleach and then you're removing the bleach with the ethanol, but you're also getting some kill of any residual particles that could be there with the ethanol. 
Okay. And would you recommend fumigation of HEPA in the cabinet? Um, absolutely. If you are worried about a biological contamination, fumigation is the easiest way to go to make sure you get all of your surfaces. If you're having a major DNA contamination and you're wanting to re at least reduce it, fumigation would work in that situation. We used chlorine dioxide in that situation. But remember that chlorine dioxide does not remove 100% of the DNA. It removed 99.7%. So there could be some leftover DNA in that situ in, left in the back plenum that you can't physically wipe. You can always rewipe the internal work surface and um, the inside of the cabinet where you actually are working. You can get a cloth in there, but inside the cabinet behind the wall you can't get to. So the fumigation could help reduce that, but it would not completely eliminate any DNA from that zone. So if you're worried about removal of DNA, fumigation is a good start. It would not be complete. But if you're worried about fumigation for um, biological removal, fumigation is a great way to go. Okay. Uh, again, we have a few more minutes, so please feel free to type in any question that you may have. Uh, going on to our next question and actually continuing with the theme of chemical decontamination, what about hydrogen peroxide? Is that good for decontamination, like alone? Um, if you're thinking about biological decontamination, hydrogen peroxide can work very well. There's a, quite a few vaporized hydrogen peroxide systems out there that have very good effective kills. Um, it has not specifically been tested on DNA removal, so I would be hesitant about that. Okay. Uh, Dr. Held, I also see a lot of questions uh, related to the, to the option of having uh, clean the uh, cabinet with the bleach followed by an ethanol rinse and water. So this question, so maybe a uh, you can touch upon that a bit more because this next question is also related, which says that does the ethanol rinse following the bleach uh, decontamination replace the need to do a water rinse on a stainless steel surface? So I see a lot of questions uh, on this topic, so if you could just elaborate uh, for all our uh, audience. Sure, okay. So the bleach is used as the primary decontamination step, and you can use bleach on stainless steel surfaces, and it's very effective. The only problem is, is that keeping bleach, even small droplets of it, on that surface for long periods of time over its required incubation period would can cause pitting in the stainless steel and destruction of the stainless steel over time. So if you're doing this kind of a wash every day or once a week, you can eventually start to break down the steel. So here at Baker, we always recommend that you want to do something to remove any residual bleach from the surface to make sure that you aren't going to be destroying your steel. Now, it, you can use sterile water because that would just remove any of the residual bleach. That's absolutely perfectly fine. Or, alternatively, you could use 70% ethanol because a lot of people are concerned about putting another agent onto their steel that is not helping any sort of contamination removal. So just by adding sterile water, it's actually only removing the residual bleach um, particles there. It's not providing any help towards decontamination. So a lot of people like to use ethanol instead because then they feel like they're putting something down on the stainless steel that's also adding to any sort of biodecontamination and cleaning step. It's not just a rinse, it's actually a second cleaning step. If you use ethanol following bleach, you do not have to do a water rinse afterwards. It's an either or. So you can do bleach and then you need to follow it up with one or the other. You can do both if you like, but it's not necessarily not necessary. You can use ethanol or isopropanol, any sort of alcohol is fine, or sterile water. But it does have to be sterile water because you don't want to be adding any more contamination to the area you just cleaned with bleach. Okay, uh, that was very clear. Uh, another question is that uh, have you at Baker done any comparison between the bleach and a DNA degrader like Eliminase? 
we have not actually. Um, that is something that we could definitely look into. We tend to go with more of a generic, um, commonly used chemicals in the lab. So we usually stick with the bleaches and the ethanols because most people have access to that. We haven't really focused in on specific brands of decontamination or DNA removal components yet. Um, but that is definitely something that we could look into. Okay. Uh, this is a question more about like uh, not really the the content, but have you published your findings uh, or is there any plan to publish the results that you just presented? Yes. So actually these, um, this study um, has been um, accepted into Applied Biosafety, the American Biosafety Association's journal, and it should be coming out in the next issue, so uh, keep your eyes out for it. Um, we also have a version that is available on our website um, for download now, so you can um, go to the Baker website, so it's bakerco.com, and um, search for DNA, and it'll pop right up. Okay. And the next question is, uh, how many HIPAA filters can a simplest safety cabinet have? Well, now that's almost a loaded question. So um, safety cabinets come in many different classes and types, and the absolute most simplest cabinet would be a class one biosafety cabinet. It has one HEPA filter. That is only protecting the personnel. So those have an, only one exhaust HEPA filter. It does not protect the environment where your work is being done, so your product. I would definitely not recommend those for this kind of work. If you're worried about a, a biosafety cabinet that would be applicable to this work, the simplest biosafety cabinet would be a type A2, which is one we talked about, and they have two HEPA filters, a supply HEPA filter and an exhaust HEPA filter. You want to make sure that the work that you're working on has been is clean, so that's the supply HEPA filter. And you also want to make sure that anything external of the environment is been cleaned as well. So that's an uh, exhaust HEPA filter. So they need at least two. Great, and I think now uh, we've completed our round of questions that were asked, and I think it's time for us to wrap up the Q and A portion. And any of you, if you have any more questions, uh, you can type in and we will try to address them offline. Uh, and as previously mentioned, this webinar has been recorded. Attendees will be able to view it in the next few days. Uh, oh, actually, we have just received, Dr. Held, another question, I think, and we do have the time uh, to answer this one. This question is, uh, can you kindly give a cost comparison for the three types of biosafety cabinets? Uh, uh, <laughs> that uh, depends on a great many factors, and um, I would definitely recommend calling in to talk to some of our um, uh, inner service representatives to get that sort of uh, numbers. I would just say that um, of the three types of cabinets that we talked about today, the A2 would be the most, the least expensive, and uh, the B1 would be the most expensive. So B2 is kind of be in the middle. Um, I cannot give particular numbers. It depends on where you are, where it's installed, what options you want. And there's just way too many factors. But please call in, call Baker um, at our 1-800 number, and um, you can speak to someone there who can give you a much more uh, detailed view of what you're looking for. Thank you, Dr. Hell. So, yes, yeah, so now I think it is finally the time to wrap up our Q&A portion. And again, as I was mentioning, uh, this session has been recorded, and we will notify via email uh, with the, all the details so that you can view it uh, at a later point. Uh, this now concludes our broadcast, and thank you for attending, and have a very good day. <laughs>